Hello, I am the Irish guy, and all right. Let's see what happened in the Premier League and the FA Cup this weekend. Right, let's go. Man City 2 and Liverpool 3. So, how did everyone enjoy their Easter weekend? I mean, did you all enjoy sticking a melted Kit Kat egg into your bowl of Cheerios? I'll tell you though, that there is one person who we all know had one of the most miserable weekends of his life. Poor old Zach Steffen. I mean, he, he's just done a Loris Carius. Admittedly, on a much smaller scale. I mean, I mean, if you mess up in a Champions League final against Real Madrid, watched by millions across the globe, then yeah, of course your career is pretty much heading the same way as Jedward's. But I mean, uh, let's be honest, nobody ever really remembers an FA Cup semi-final. I mean, so you can get away with it a bit more. But good Christ, 12 million people watched a video called Laughing at Carius. No wonder he's now a forgotten bodybuilder, probably chained to a sink in a rat-infested dungeon underneath Melwood Rice. But listen, Zach Steffen, I still Maintain though, this is the end of his Manchester City career. And lads, Pep Guardiola is ruthless. And especially when it comes to goalkeepers. I mean, does nobody remember within five minutes of his first cup of coffee as Man City boss, he was tossing away to England number one because he wasn't an expert with the ball at his feet. I mean, since then, Hearts just turned into a disheveled, depressed mess. Probably now reduced to eating shampoo on toast. But there is an air of arrogance in the media when they talk about Man City. Because last weekend, Ederson almost let a ball trickle under his foot for one of the most outrageously horrendous own goals of all time. And yet, uh, this was an actual newspaper headline. Edison's moment of madness was all part of Pep Guardiola's grand plan. No, 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 no it wasn't. He slipped. Come on, Pep is Pep, but he's not Zeus. Wow, was Zach Steffen kicking the ball off Manning into his own net? Part of the grand plan? Listen, Liverpool were brilliant and blew City out of the water in the first half. But this mistake, it was horrible. And he's never going to play for the club again. But what? What is the obsession with choosing to persist with an alleged cup goalie? What even is a cup goalie? Well, it's this new modern day fad. It's just Pep trying to be nice. We have number one goalkeepers for a reason. Would you rather be nice to your number two than win this competition? And do you not remember, Stefan was responsible for you losing last year's semi-final to Chelsea. Ederson has only played one FA Cup game since winning the Wembley final by six goals. And that was three years ago. Does that not tell you something? Picking Stefan does not work. The FA Cup is a monster competition. So why, instead of being afforded the luxury of picking arguably one of the top two goalies in the world. Are you then choosing to pick the guy who used to play college football for Maryland Terrapins? Something that sounds like it's run by Mary Poppins. Why is Pep Guardiola trusting a guy whose only lone move away from the club ended in relegation with Fortuna Dusseldorf? I mean, this is only his ninth game of the season. And uh, he he's now lost four of them and only kept one clean sheet. One clean sheet in nine games as a Manchester City goalkeeper. I know he couldn't even manage to keep a clean sheet against the likes of Swindon and Wickham Wanderers. So what did you think was going to happen here against Liverpool? Listen, I don't know why, but the USA have a reputation for producing a lot of top goalies. Weirdly enough, I mean, Chris, well, there were five American goalies who had a combined 1,319 games in the Premier League. That is uh, pretty mental, but usually those goalies are all mid-table quality goalkeepers. Even Brad Friel's best years were at Blackburn and Aston Villa. Tim Howard spent a decade at Everton. America produces top quality mid-table goalies. Stefan shouldn't be playing for anyone higher than Crystal Palace. I'm sorry, Stefan, this guy is 27 years old and has two Premier League matches to his name. He needs to leave and honestly, right now, Manchester City fans are screaming for Gavin Bazinou to replace him. You know, that 20-year-old Dubliner ripping up League One with Portsmouth on loan? Ozzy, Stefan, you should be worried. Oh, so very nervous because Bazunu is a uh, seven years your junior and already a better goalie. We've already seen Queeving Kelleher kill the career of Adriana Danfield. So sorry, Stefan, you're next on the hit list. Irish goalkeepers are taking over the world. West Ham won, Burnley won. I still don't understand this. Why did Burnley sack Sean Dyche if they don't have a ready-made replacement available? What did he do that he needed to sack him on Friday? Oh, uh, did, did he storm into the Burnley boardroom before doing a poo on the table? Was he found urinating in a dishwasher at the training ground? Did he completely snap and choose to shove the corner flag down the groundsman's throat? I, I don't get it. Because maybe, maybe if you had a ready-made replacement ready to go in the dugout, maybe I could understand 10% of it. But now, you instead just promoted the coach of the Burnley under-23s. And I'm sorry, it's a bit of a bad sign when the underage kitty team are being managed by someone called Michael Jackson. How do you think that went down at parent-teacher meetings? That's like finding out that your sister is off to the cinema on a date 
with someone called Ted Bundy. Uh, it's not a great namesake to have. And in Burnley's position, every Premier League match is crucial. They are so, so precious. And here you are, giving a valuable potential chance of three points to the guy who is sacked after just 13 games at Tranmere Rovers. Someone whose entire coaching career just involves sitting in the sweaty shirt pocket of Mickey Mellon. Oh, even the name Mickey Mellon sounds like a male drag queen you might find in a bar in Dundee. Michael Jackson is about as experienced as a charge of a Premier League match as I am to perform open heart surgery on my cat. I mean, I feel bad for these Burnley players. In the space of three days, they've lost their manager, their leader of 10 years, and now seeing Ashley West would snap his ankle. Although, judging by the reaction of Nikola Vlasic, yet swear the doctors now need to amputate his knee. Ah, uh, honestly, I get that Vlasic feels an element of guilt here, but I mean, relax. I'm sorry, West will be fine. You're reacting to this as if you just accidentally stabbed him in the face. But honestly, this, this could have been a vital Burnley win. You're coming up against a distracted West Ham team. I mean, just like a Fulham pulled off the great escape on the final day of the season against the Portsmouth team who were preparing for the FA Cup final in 2008. You know, wimping out of tackles so they wouldn't get an injury. And similarly, these West Ham players, all they can think about is a potential European fine. I mean, it surely dominates their thought all day. I mean, Ozzy, you really think Mark Noble is able to concentrate sitting at home on the couch watching The Lion King with his son? No, no, these players should arguably at their driving license stuffed in a microwave for the next month because how can they pay attention to anything else? But Maxwell Cornet, hang your head in shame. Burnley are one up. You just won a penalty, but why? Why have you decided that now is the time to take your first penalty in eight years? He's only ever taken penalties for the France under 18s. Yeah, and well, he's currently 25 and he plays for the Ivory Coast. That was a long time ago. Why are you trying to attempt to do something you haven't done since you were a teenager? Honestly, you don't see me trying to stick my knob in a toaster anymore. Wout Weghorst and Jay Rodriguez were both on the pitch. Two men who scored a combined 37 penalties. Nearly 40 pens between them, and they're both letting Cornet wrestle him off the ball. I mean, no, no, there's much to blame as him. I don't get it. Can everyone stop trying to be polite? This, this is serious business. Just fight off the ego of Cornet and take the penalty. Why are you trusting him from 12 yards when he's never taken a penalty in his entire career in adult football? You know, against grown men. Plus, he sounds like a brand of ice cream. I mean, come on. This is like if some chubby guy in a Hawaiian shirt storms into an airplane's cockpit and asks the pilot if he can fly the plane. Ah, uh, no, no, you can't fly the plane. Go back to your seat and eat your cup of Pringles. Leave this to the professionals. Cornet had absolutely no training in taking a pressure penalty. I don't get this. Do you really think Dice would have stood for this? Again, no. If he even saw Cornet ask for the ball, he looks like he would immediately break his fingers in the door of his Jeep. A win here would have taken you to within just a point of Everton. And the pressure would really have been on. But now this, just a shocking display of non-leadership. Southampton won, Arsenal nil, and Tottenham nil, Brighton won. Yeah, I might as well lump in the two North London clubs here together because it's the same story. I mean, do either team actually want the Champions League? I mean, clearly not, because Tottenham, a home match with Brighton and you registered no shots on target. Honestly, they had a former Rochdale goalie in Nets and he didn't have to make a single save. You've allowed Brighton and Hove Albion to turn up in your own patch and dominate the game before Leandro Trussard scuffles in a last minute winner. I mean, you've just seen Arsenal bullied off the pitch by Brighton. I mean, Tottenham fans probably spent that afternoon cackling like hyenas. And yet now, you've just allowed them to do the same thing to you the year is 2022, and you're watching Danny Welbeck walk out of your spaceship of a stadium with three points in his back pocket. And similarly, Arsenal, you turn up to a ground where Southampton were smashed 6-0 last week. I mean, Fraser Forster should, should have spent the last few days crying in front of the mirror, terrified that he'd now received the same fate as the two other goalies involved in 9-0 defeats, and that it was his turn to have his CV stuffed in a dishwasher. But instead, this... This was the Forster of old. This wasn't the first time he played like Pete Buffon against the Gunners. He was doing this eight years ago in December 2014. And he was doing it again in 2016. Aussie, some Arsenal season ticket holders give it 50 years and they're going to be gargling on some mashed up banana in the nursing home having PTSD flashbacks of this man. It's bad enough that he looks like that butler of the Adams family. But for some reason, whenever he plays against Arsenal, he suddenly climb out of her can. I mean, th there's only one thing to do, Mikel Arteta. This summer, sign him up as a backup goalie on a free. How many times does he pass his Arsenal audition with flying colours? Get this man in an Arsenal kit. Man United 3, Norwich 2. Cristiano Ronaldo is a freak. How? How does he keep doing this? This man who's supposed to be having an utterly rotten season in England, right? Just some Portuguese beanballs slowing down attacks and smashing phones. I mean, apparently Ronaldo at Man United is like watching Peter Crouch in a Burnley shirt. And yet... He's still got 21 goals for Man United this season. He's just scored two Premier League hat-tricks in a month. And he's, he's 37. 
What? He has scored 30 hat tricks since he turned 30. This is this is mental. But as for the match, Nard should have taken at least a point. Uh, I'm sorry, but they turned up to Old Trafford and they had a goal. 15 shots at goal. And lads, if David Gea didn't have wrists made of metal, then lads, Dean Smith would have left Old Trafford with two wins this season. And using utterly butterball defenders like Ben Gibbs and Grant Hanley and Courtney House. That would have been some minor miracle in itself. Watford won Brentford 2. Watford are done. They are toast. Does somebody want to tell me? What? What was the point of bringing in Roy Hodgson? I've already said this a million times, but was it really sensible? Appointing a guy who's probably seen Frank Sinatra in concert. I mean, Watford are down, but I think it, it's amazing. Christian Eriksen is one of the greatest Premier League signings in history. The fact that only Brentford FC were willing to touch him is a disgrace. The footballing world were clearly so freaked out by him last summer. Now suddenly, they just acted as if he was some porcelain dog. Oh, handle with care. No, let's wake up. He's not exactly an incontinent grandmother on the bus. He's coming to Brentford and they're on a run of no wins in eight games and staring down the barrel of relegation. But since he started playing, five wins in six? This man's mere presence in a Brentford shirt has galvanized the entire club. 15 points from a possible 18. What this reminds me of is when Leicester somehow turned it on in the spring of 2015 and ended the season with seven wins from nine. I mean, they talk about second season syndrome. Leicester's second season syndrome was winning the Premier League and all because they carried their greatest game momentum into the next season to the point where it didn't really matter who the manager was. So I'm not saying that Brentford are going to win the Premier League next season, but if they carry this momentum into next year, anything can happen. Newcastle 2, Leicester 1. St. James's Park. We are looking at the next fortress of English football. I mean, in the past 20 years, this once proud theatre has just been a graveyard perched on a hill. Honestly, it's just been one big, soulless, drab, sports direct billboard. I mean, honestly, try to wade your way through the crowd on match day, and, and it was all just a bit sad. How are the Geordies really supposed to get excited for the big game when they see Paul Dummett's face on the match programme? I mean, please tell me how. Since the day Sir Bobby Robson was sacked, this place is honestly be like attending the funeral for your nan. But going forward in the next few years, honestly, this is going to be England's answer to Borussia Dortmund. 50,000 people piled into the stadium on Easter Sunday, when they could have been stuck at home eating roast pudding with their mother, stuffing their face with Easter eggs, whilst pretending to laugh at their weird uncle's jokes. But instead, here they were, a last minute win over Leicester, and treating it as if they just won the cup. Chelsea 2, Crystal Palace 0. Good win for Chelsea, pretty routine 2-0 win. Goal from Ruben Loftus Cheek and Mason Mount. Well lads, these two joined the club in 2004 and 2005. Loftus Cheek arrived at Chelsea the same summer Josie Mourinho did for the first time. How long ago was that? A bit mental when, with all the millions this club has spent, that the two goal scorers in this FA Cup semi-final were just two homegrown children in the academy. Honestly, that, that's kind of nice. And if you guys want to watch, you can let me know in the comments if you want to join the video. Don't forget to like share, guys. Always, I'll talk to you in a while.